whether it's how the buildings are whether it's how the buildings are occupied, the lighting system, anything that you're having to encounter, we want to know about it because if an emergency happens, I need to understand your building envelope. Um, about me and, and why am I here? I've uh, been doing this for a little while. These are pictures of me being in the suit. Um, just like everybody else, I'm into off-roading, normal guy, fishing, camping. Uh, he still hasn't invited me to any trips, but maybe it's because I don't have a Jeep, but I'm a Ford guy. So, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but as far as the professional side of it, I've been doing this for a while. This is obviously a little bit of an older photo. I'm about 14,000 projects that I've done in my career. So I've seen large ones, small ones, um, ones that will make your skin peel and ones that, you know, everything in between. So I, I've kind of done it quite a bit. I do have three master certifications through our accreditation. I have master water fire and smoke and also textile cleaners um had to learn about carpets had to understand how different carpets respond to floods and fires and smells and repairs to be able to understand that when you have a hallway that's 120 feet long and there's two square feet of it that's flooded out how to preserve it how to make sure that we don't destroy it um, our industry has a very popular phrase of when in doubt cut it out and i i don't like that we are a restoration company we're not a demo company Demo is just something that we do in order to restore. So enough about us and how great we are. Um, I apologize also, I'm not used to clicking my keyboard. I usually have this, but the new dongle technology kind of makes it hard. So I'm kind of stumbling through it a little bit. So why are you here? We're gonna learn about a few points, as I mentioned, when it comes to managing buildings. Understanding the harm, which is gonna be the concerns in your workplace in the building, as best as the mold falls into that category. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to properly respond to those emergencies and also how to plan ahead. And as I mentioned, some of the new things that have come out in the industry. So we're gonna start with the general concerns. So this is gonna be my first question to everybody. Give me an answer of when you think asbestos was banned in the United States. Right? You said 80? Okay, two more. 72. 72. Five, seven, six. Okay. What was that, Joey? Seven, Joey, did you answer? Yes, sir. Oh, it was one, 1972. 1972. Okay. So that's Sorry about that. I was on mute. Oh, it's all good. So all great answers, but the actual answer is never. So the key word is banned. Banned was, asbestos has never been banned for use in United States. What has been banned from is production. And that was in the late seventies. The number that everybody thinks about that 81, 82, that is an OSHA rule that applies to residential. That has nothing to do with commercial properties because that falls under NISHA, which is EPA, not OSHA. OSHA regulates your exposure limits. It has nothing to do with construction. NISHA, National Emission Standard for Health and Air Pollutants, is the one that regulates waste from buildings demolition. Therefore, building materials fall under the EPA category, not under OSHA. But all of them are good guesses. And again, in the residential, 82 is a cutoff. Does anybody know why 82 was a number, even though the ban happened in the 70s? Mm -hmm. Shelf stock. They wanted to give enough time for things on the shelf to get used up. Because mm -hmm. nobody's gonna go throw away all their Henry roof patching that was amazing, that had asbestos in there, right? You're gonna use it up. Exactly. So the answer is never. Now it gets a lot more into detail, but just remember never. And the reason I mentioned to you is very often we'll come out to a building that was built in 2010, we have to do asbestos testing and the property manager looks at it and goes, this is a new building. What are you talking about? Or even better, of our knows about this, general contractors. Just put the drywall in, just mud it in tape and it gets damaged. We have to test it before we remove it. So when they, when they say why, do you remember Chinese drywall? So we have so much materials that are imported into this country that we can't control them. A lot of people think that the lead buildings, if you have lead platinum, somehow excuses you from that. I have a letter from the EPA that says, we don't recognize that, we don't care about that. 
If it is built, if it's con uh, constructed, we want it tested. And this is one of the only things that it is asbestos until proven not. It's not the other way. And if the inspector comes out, which we've had them come out to our job sites, if they come out and you don't have a survey, that's a violation, even if it's not an asbestos containing material. So as I mentioned, we think that it's a problem in the past. It's not. There's still about 3,000 different materials that come in that contain that. In fact, when we work in manufacturing facilities that use steam and things like that, there's still a good use for it. Asbestos was an awesome product. It was just terrible from when it got inside our body. But when it came to the buildings, as far as fire resistant, heat resistant, acid resistant, base resistant, all of these things that went with it made it a really good material. Just don't eat it or inhale it. Um, as I mentioned, 81 was what everybody believed. Uh, we do not believe that EPA is going to be changing. There's been some verbiage about it. Anybody who knows about federal government, they're not going to spend money on things that it's not really big issue and funding is not one of those things that they have a lot of right now. And that's part of the reason why the ban never went into place is once they banned the production and all the manufacturers said, we're not going to produce any more of it. They looked around and said, well, we don't have to worry about it anymore. So we just got to let it ride out. So there is a ban for production. There is no ban for use. What is asbestos? Anybody know? Lead. Uh, kind of like a rock, kind of like rock is formed out where it is. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, in Arizona, up north by the mines, there are still natural veins of asbestos there. It is just a mineral, it's a rock. And why did manufacturers love it? Well, you mine it, you crush it, it becomes cotton candy. You add it to whatever material you want. Now you made the material better and stronger. As a manufacturer, that's amazing, quick and easy. But that's the issue with it is because it's a mineral, what happens once it gets into our body, our body can't break it down. Remember, heat resistant, acid resistant, base resistant, all of those things, our body can only do so much. And I'll get a little bit further into it about some of the side effects of it, but that's why they love it. Um, it is, as we talked about it being um, naturally found and naturally mined, it is great for thermal insulation. There's still places that use it. Um, ASU still has quite a bit of it. Uh, if anybody's known about ASU, there's actually like tunnels underneath the building. Um, this whole campus has tunnels. When you go into it, that picture that I showed me with a mask with a sign that said asbestos was walking out of that tunnel. There's still a lot, a lot of asbestos pipes in there and they leave them and they need them and they use them, especially for the labs and the steam and everything they do. But in those tunnels, there's a bunch of rocks. And because of all the work that has been done, they know that they will never be able to clean it. It's like a river rock bottom that you walk there. So they just call it contaminated and leave it as is. But it is still used, it is still found in buildings. We still encounter in buildings. Oh, about 10 years ago, maybe even 12 now, time flies. Uh, we had a customer that wanted to replace their ceiling tiles that had asbestos. And they shipped in really fancy Italian ones. We tested it, it had more asbestos than the ones it took out. <laughs> still happens. Um, design teams love to make it really hard for us to control buildings, right? It looks fancy on, on a computer somewhere and they're like, here, go make it happen. There's still about 10,000 people that die in US from asbestos related diseases. If you find yourself late at night watching TV, there's still infomercials. Methothelioma, lung cancer, all those commercials are still out there because there's still people who are getting those illnesses. The worst part about it is my industry is one of the biggest offenders. And um, training education is a big thing. Sometimes uh, companies wanna satisfy the clients so much that they will fail to follow those steps and they won't test. Um, we don't, we've taken a lot of grief for that and we would rather walk away from a project than violate the federal law because it is a law. So not just a regulation, you can and will go to jail for it. There are people sitting in jail right now for what they refer to as a willful violation. So please be aware of what you're doing. Another thing that sucks about asbestos, um, Building owner hires a property manager, property manager hires engineering, you guys, you guys hire a company to come in and do the work. In your contracts, in your paperwork says you will follow all the rules, regulations. Everything is in there nice and tight. That company fails to follow those regulations. When inspector comes out from ADQ, they cite the contractor, 
It will cite you, the property manager, and the building owner. It does not stop saying, well, I told you not to do this, so it's your fault. Um, ASU got to experience that in their uh, one of their facilities when they hired a GC who hired a demo contractor, who hired a flooring demo contractor, who pulled up carpet and there was BCT tile underneath it, and they didn't test. Who got the biggest fine? ASU. It was about 120000 Who got the smallest fine? The contractor who was doing the demo because he could, they could only find him the value of his contract, 3200 bucks. So if you uh, Google ASU as best as violations, it will come up. They actually had to have a town hall meeting for all the people that lived around there to let them know that they created this violation. And they had to set money aside for future testing and making sure that those people are safe. So it's, uh, it is a federal law. Can they find the individual engineer? themselves then they're not gonna well yes because that's the willful violation so there is uh in my refresher just right now they were, I had to go through it recently uh they were talking about an excavator operator who's in jail uh, as best as abatement was done and um when it was done he, they came back said it's all clear there was digging that he had to do while digging he came across a pipe and he was supposed to stop and say, hey, because the site is known to have asbestos pipe and it was abated, this may be one of it. He did it. So he got cited. I think he got like four months in jail for that uh, because they say you should have stopped. You knew that this site had potential. Plus, it's a new material that has to be inspected to make sure it falls into the testing criteria that we actually test those materials. And he was in an excavator operator. And obviously, the guy was trying to get the job done. I mean, especially with the pressure we have right now, everybody's short staff, skilled labor short. We want to try to get as much done, but we sometimes need to slow down just a little bit. Guys, bear in mind that this doesn't just go for asbestos. You guys as trained professionals, if you knowingly and willfully do something that's illegal, immoral, or unsafe, they're going to attempt to hold you personally accountable. Obviously, your employer has your back, but, you know, this is the reality of, of knowingly and willfully yep. violating, meaning you had to know what you did was wrong. Yep. Yeah, that willful word is used very often, especially when they know better. Can I just throw one other example? Of course. The uh, building that collapsed in um, Florida. Mm-hmm. Back to the structure. Do you think people were held individually for that also. I think it's a little early to tell right now. There's they're still going through all the details. Neither of the same. They're going back 10 years on every single person that touched that building, yeah. anybody who had a position of authority on that board. They're going back 10 years so far. Yep. Yeah. And so that doesn't mean everybody that touched it for the last 10 years is in trouble, but they're going to talk to everybody and see who's got the deepest pockets. As a guy who's been through about five depositions, nothing wrong but representing our customers, they suck. Depositions absolutely suck. They will squeeze you out. They will play these mind games. It's even going through the questioning part sucks. I, I'd rather not do it ever again. Um, so think about as best as why not to panic. It's only a hazard if it's disturbed. If the glue behind here is as best as containing, it doesn't affect us. If the ceiling texture has as best as in it, it doesn't affect us unless we disturb it. And that's when you get the two coming in. You got the EPA under NISHA, and you got OSHA for the personal safety. So a scary fact, which hard to approve, is that if you drill a hole, you could violate OSHA, it depends on the drill you used, how big it was, how much dust was generated. So that's where the OSHA comes in. EPA will only come in if the material has more than 1% asbestos containing. So if you ever encounter a project, when they come in, they go, oh, it's less than 1%. That's cool. EPA is not involved. OSHA is still involved. So make sure that we are understanding that, that it's two different things. OSHA has to do with our exposure. EPA has to do with waste. What kind of materials contain asbestos? Well, we know roof penetrations, mastics, shingles, uh, duct tape, duct seam. Anybody know where this is from? It was on the news. I'll give you a hint. Back to when we had our hailstorm here and every roofing company in the country ran it. This was a pile downtown. Um, somebody rented this lot and went to the roofing companies and said, hey, bring us your roof waste and they collected fees. And then they left. And this was left for the city to clean up. And it was as best as container. 
So that was a very big project. I remember there was a crazy bidding war going on there because everybody wanted for bragging rights. And obviously that's quite a bit of money. But that did happen. And I mean, that wasn't that long ago. Um, commercial roofs, we find less and less and less containing asbestos. They're still residential, that's higher because most homeowners don't often replace their roofs or maintain them same way the commercial buildings do. Um, all these different HVAC components, usually we'll find it here. Uh, schools, we still find quite a bit on, um, especially public schools. Any kind of gymnastic, any kind of penetrations, any kind of bandages, that is all suspect. Stucco, never have a head stucco come back positive, ever. But it is something that can be made thriving. It is something that can be disturbed and it is not in the category of never being as best as containing, which we'll get to a little bit later. Paint, the only time I've seen paint is tennis courts. <clears throat> All that green and everything they put in it is usually was um, as best as containing. Pool plaster, obviously simple, pour it in, ready to go. Floors, we all know about the small black mastic and the eight by eights and the nine by nine tiles, very much suspect. However, I've had black glue come back non-containing and I've had yellow glue come back containing and goes both ways. Um, here's a next trivia question. So let's say you have a VCT tile in your, um, in your building you work at. It's three colors, it's reds, it's blues, and it's greens, right? Different tiles. Same manufacturer, same design, same pattern, same everything. If I'm coming out to test, am I testing one color, all colors? What do you guys think? All of them. Okay. Um, you, you, give, me, give me an explanation of why. It can be made from different materials. Correct. A lot of people say it's the same uh, material. It's just a different dye. That's often we'll say. Um, so when it comes to stress testing, we have to test what's called homogeneous areas. A homogeneous areas referred to as being same color, same texture, same material, same installation time. It has to be as close to the same as possible. Those three colors, they're different. And they can say, well, this color is made here and this color is made there, and they use this type of dye here and this type of dye there. It no longer falls into the category of homogeneous area. Let me tell you, it sucks. A lot of those, when we come in and do 30 square foot of removal, and there's three colors in there, I could have taken nine samples, as opposed to normally be three samples. It is a very hard message to communicate to make people understand why, but that's the law. How much per test? Depends on your turnaround time. That's really what drives the cost. You can be down as low as 15 bucks a sample. You can be as high as $75 a sample. Three hour turnaround obviously costs more. Uh, the 10 day will cost you about 10 bucks. They just put you in the back of the pile will eventually get to you kind of situation. In emergency situations, when it comes to floods, 99.9% .9 of the time we do the three hour so we can get started right away. While we're extracting, the hygienists are taking samples. So by the time we're done extracting, we're usually getting the lab results. Adhesive we talk about, these are referred to hockey pucks in our industry. Um, as you can kind of see, they, they look like hockey pucks. Uh, duct tape we talked about, duct sealants, um, anything that they would have want to last longer and be stronger. Uh, fireproofing, I think everybody knows the fireproofing is always suspect to that. But I like this picture and I show this to show you guys that removal of all fireproofing is not always the answer. If you only need to put some hangers, if you need to do some work, you can remove that section. These edges of where it is, there's actually an EPA approved product to seal it back up so it doesn't continue to come off. You can marry new fireproofing to it. So just understand that when you run this situation, you don't have to take on this big abatement project. Just focus on what you will be disturbing. That's all they care about is that the materials that you disturb are done in proper way. It's hard to see here from the uh, from the on the web or on on the phone, but are you talking about Monaco? Yes. Is the camera not capturing that? It, it's just hard to see on the on, on a mobile phone. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's, it's pretty small. Ah, anything I can do to help with that? I don't. No, it's just it's just I'm I'm just seeing it on the phone. Oh, it's no. just tough. Ah, okay. Uh, vermiculite. Anybody know what vermiculite is and what it's found? It's insulation. Okay. Nice and fine, so too. Mm -hmm. Where is it normally placed then with the insulation? In block. Yes. Yes. Uh, city block walls. 
You ever drill a hole in a cinder block wall and this stuff pours out? It's true. Stop. Vermiculite itself is not asbestos. When I was in grade school, <laughs> we knocked holes in the wall and let that stuff come out. <laughs> it, it pours out really quick and easy. Like that very fast. <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with breathing, not thinking. So I'm going to defend him on that one. Um, vermiculite itself is not asbestos, but the veins intertwine in nature. And when they mine it, it becomes contaminated. So don't always be afraid of it. We've tested vermiculite and it was not containing. Um, but it itself is not, but it falls into the category of being something that you need to be aware of. <laughs> drywall, joint compound. Never seen it in drywall. It's always texture. It's always texture. I've never really seen it in the actual gypsum itself. Um, granted, I started in the industry in 90s. Maybe in, in the 80s, it would have been more common, but it's always joint compound or texture. Um, obviously, popcorn ceiling. That's, that was a big offender, but I don't know any commercial buildings that still have popcorn anywhere. I think that's for the most part. That's, yeah, I think for the most part, that's been gone. So that's still going to be like a residential thing. But if you run into it, it is suspect. As I mentioned, ceiling tiles can be. Never run into it having that, but EPA looks at it as being one of those materials that needs to be considered. This is very common. Um, some of these pictures are actually from ASU from their uh, steam pipes and everything they deliver to the lab for whatever testing they do. Often you will see it looks more bandagey. The new one has that white paper with a yellow insulation inside of it. It's still suspect and we still have to test it. But if it looks like a cast, pretty much 99% positive that's asbestos. We have a uh, question from Brian. Is using equipment to high heat a room after extraction being done in the industry? Is using? Is using equipment to high heat a room after extraction being done in the industry? Does he mean increase the temperature in the room for evaporation? Brian? Using a devices to heat a room that uh, would be I've seen this done years ago where they would blanket the room uh, after extracting the water from the damaged areas and they would do the holes in the base of the walls and then they would put in heaters that would heat the area tremendously, um, even enough to kill mold and dry it. And, because and, there's, a, there's a section I'm going to be coming and, onto that has equipment that will touch on that. And I want yeah. to actually put a red flag in the kill mold part of it, but I will touch on it a little bit further down. Short answer is yes. Long answer is maybe. He okay. doesn't care more but I will get back to that. I have a section on that about equipment that will answer some of that. Everybody heard the question, right? Yeah. I mean, like wrapping the room in a bag. I mean, I saw it done years ago, but I've just never heard of it anymore after that. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that part of it. Okay, cool. Thank you. So we talked about everything that can be asbestos. Can somebody name me three things that are not asbestos containing and can never be asbestos containing? Glass. Awesome. Glass. Who was that? Who said glass? Brian. Joey. Question for you. Joey said uh, glass. There's a key word to it. That's why I'm asking. I'm not talking about what type of tree. Tree. Framing this stuff. I'll give it to you. It's bare wood. Can't be any paint. Can't have any. No, it, 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 just, it has to be in its own natural state. Um, but that's the, the key word. It has to be bare wood. Um, so we got glass. We got wood. <coughs> Last one's easy. Metal. metal. Um, glass, metal, or wood will never, ever, ever contain asbestos. This can't. The production of glass will not be able to do that. We know about metal and how it's produced. There would be no purpose for um, asbestos to be introduced to that process. And obviously wood grows naturally, right? So there's no way to add that to it. So those are the three things that are never suspect for mold and are never tested. We talked about, about the different regulations and what applies, right? So we said EPA applies to the environment, OSHA applies to employee, to safety of us. 
If anybody's under your direct reporting and told to go do something, OSHA can come after you because you technically consider their supervisor. So as he said, willful violations is really what they're looking for. A little bit about mold. Um, this picture is to kind of help you guys understand mold is like a dandelion. So as long as we remember that, it will help us um, interact with it, oh, sorry. not spread it further. And I'll get into the detail about what I mean by that. So what, what is mold? Um, to be honest, it is a term and a thing that is very popular with the lawyers. Mold is naturally occurring. It's a natural element out there. You go outside, you're breathing it. You go camping up north for fresh air, sure, your CO2 levels are down, but everything else is higher. Mold is literally everywhere. Everywhere. You're breathing it right now. You'll breathe it when you're at home. You'll breathe it when you're in the shower. If you're eating cheese, you're consuming it. It is around us. But the media and the lawyers love the black toxic mold. So mold is an item that- Naturally occurring that element. Is, that is exaggerated by the or the sweetie. Well, <laughs> Yes, no and no. So here's, here's the thing about it because it's no occurring, right? We also know that our human body needs a balance. So, if you were to drink two gallons of water right now, you would pass that it, it, it just too much, right? Yeah. So, anything too much of anything is bad. So, what we're looking for is a balanced air quality. Somebody says, I'm allergic to mold, I need a mold free environment. That should be a red flag because they have a Google PhD. They looked it up online, they saw the black toxic mold, they saw a lady sitting there in the news <laughs> crying about it, and they feel they can get something from it. Mold is everywhere. All that you are required for the buildings that you operate in is to provide a balanced air quality. What does balanced mean? Equal to or less than outdoors. That's what our industry standard says. There is not saying 200 is too much, 100 is too much. But you will get attorneys because you gotta understand with lawsuits, very few of them actually make it to court. They settle out. So attorneys, insurance companies will make it go away. So if somebody brings a lawsuit that building had mold and they're now somewhat sick from it, how do you determine that it happened in that building or when he went camping up north and slept on the ground near a bunch of mushrooms and rotting away branches and leaves and everything else? You can't. So the insurance companies know that and they settle. So what is happening, you start building up all these lawsuits. But yes, it is one of those areas that is very easy for somebody to bring up a false claim. And we hear it all the time. I'm allergic to all kinds of mold. Well, you need to be in a plastic bubble because you're breathing. In Phoenix, on an average day, in an imaginary box of one pound of air, which is three feet by three feet by three feet, there's approximately 750 to 2,000 mold spores in that box. New Orleans, 20,000, 25,000. So if I come into your building and you have 400 indoors and 200 outdoors, I'm gonna tell you you're on balance. We gotta take care of it. If you were in a different state where the levels are higher, I'd be like, you're perfectly clean, don't even worry about it. This is where our industries had a really hard time of establishing a norm. As best as is easy. We know how many fibers, we know the concentration, we are able to document. With mold, it is very loose. So the best thing to do is don't use that four letter word ever. Don't ever tell them what's gonna happen. Don't get into it because anybody with a keyboard can write all kinds of blogs and stories. And if the person searches for it and it fits into that criteria, they're gonna get all kinds of information and good luck walking that one back. We don't say mold, we say, undesirable, secondary damage, those kind of things. That's what we talk about. So try to keep that out. Uh, mold is like a, like a fungus. It is a fungus. It's like a mushroom. What you see on the top of it is a smaller amount. The roots are actually in the drywall. So when somebody talks about killing mold, and I'll touch on that one right now, mold has two issues. It can infect us. It can affect us. When you have allergies, you're getting affected by the air quality. You're not getting infected. If mold was in an operating room and you were laying there and they were doing a procedure and it landed in you, because it's moist, because it's warm, it can grow. So if I was to kill it, that doesn't mean it is safe for occupying that space. However, yes, it will prevent those dead mold spores from reproducing again. But remember we talked about mold is always around us. 
if an organic material you do when you open the window you introduce new ones if the conditions are too pleasant for it to be able to grow it will consume those spores as a food source so first answer to that is we remove it because it can still affect somebody myth fun facts and everything else in between um everything in the building that you have is capable of growing mold. Does that mean that mold is digesting your concrete? No. When you're in a shower and you see all that slime on it, is it actually eating the tile? No. It's eating organic material. Well, what's organic in our buildings? Dust. Dust is the number one thing. What is dust con uh, composed out of? Skin. Mostly skin cells. So that's what mold will be able to digest. So you can't have it on block walls. You can't have it on time. Unlikely, especially with janitorial services, they stay on top of it, but it is possible. All it needs is water. That's the one last element that's left to make it grow. Effects in it, obviously, we talk about allergy-like symptoms that's being affected by it. Yes, you can still get an infection. If you have an open wound, if you have um, any kind of injuries to your body, there is a possibility you can get an infection. Rarely do we see that. Only in hospitals is a big concern there. Mostly we see sneezing, coughing, headaches, inability to sleep, those kind of normal body cycles that get interrupted. Um, we have a lot of customers that used to believe that anytime drywall got wet, it grew mold, period. If it got wet, they wanna cut it up. They don't wanna dry it. That's not true. This is an example of a wall that was dried out, kind of open, it's proved that it is not always what happens. This is an example of a contract that we didn't do it correctly. They saw the tile and they got scared. <laughs> Obviously they didn't want to remove it. There's no more tile available. So they set up blowers, they ran this for a long time. When we were called in, there was a funny smell in the house. This is back to my previous career before Restoration HQ. So I took some of those photos with me. We cut it open and you can see mold inside the wall. You can dry with tile. You just have to be strategic about it. You still have to get air inside the wall to help evaporation. You still have to get humidity outside of the wall to remove it. Otherwise, that humidity will work its way up and settle and get absorbed somewhere else. This contractor dried the surface. The drywall was dry. Inside, it was not. Um, another thing that we, we try to take pride in is when we come out to flood to try to document pre-existing conditions to make sure that we provide the customer all the facts of the situation, allowing you to make the best decision. In this situation, we got called by a mechanical contractor who hit a pipe and flooded it out. When we came out, we marked where the moisture was. As soon as we pulled that base, we saw mold. They told the contractor, well, this has got to be yours. Like, this happened two hours ago. This is not possible. I don't get in those arguments. I provide information to you guys so you can do whatever you need with it. Obviously, we all know it can't go that way. This was a pre-existing condition. This is one of the fun ones, and the building engineers who actually saved me. This was a children's asthma and allergy clinic. You remove this base and it's there. Uh, this was a plumber's fault. They said, well, it must have been a slow leak, and this is what happened. You're responsible. True, it makes sense. If it was a slow leak before it actually let go, this could happen. But building engineers walking by. I said, hey, does this area ever flooded? He's like, oh yeah, there's a bathroom right there. The kids keep putting paper towels in it, it floods all the time. So what do you do? Well, we just mop it up. It happens, right? So not everybody's of your guys' caliber. You've encountered people in your industry that may or may not know what they're doing. They'll mop it up and think it's fine. Again, I presented this information to the client. They did get to decide what they want to do with it. In this case, the plumbing company took care of it because obviously it's a good customer for them. So they made that decision. But we want to empower you and give you the tools to make that choice. Wood floors, whew, those are very, very expensive to dry, even more expensive to replace. And those suckers will bow out three, four, five feet. I've seen a uh, basketball court that just looked like a roller coaster, right? Because it expands, it's got nowhere to go. So those are very difficult to dry. Whenever wood floors get impacted, first thing we ask, is it engineered? Is it pergo? What kind of flooring it is? Unless it's some real wood with some fancy veneer, we look at the cost of saving it to replacing it.
But Pergo, all those snap tongue ones, the particle board ones, they'll swell up right away. Don't waste your time. Plus they put a, uh, a quiet mat, moisture, uh, vapor barrier underneath it sometimes. That will trap moisture there and it just, it's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, wallpaper. Wallpaper is very good at hiding it. If you ever see light colored wallpaper, you walk by and you ever see pink spots at the bottom of it, 99% positive that's mold. I have no idea why it turns pink, some kind of reaction with the glues or with the mycotoxins of what the mold's releasing. But if you ever see pink spots, pull it up, you're gonna have some mold there. Don't they keep hotels on kind of like a constant rotation of stripping a couple of rooms worth of wallpaper and refinishing them like throughout the year? Because every time they open up one, the whole damn place is nothing but mold. <laughs> so funny thing about hotels, they only care about one thing, heads and beds. We've had general managers to tell us, put the base back on. Flood never happened. You're like, uh, but it did. They're like, no, you're not listening to me. We have people coming in and they're staying there tonight. <laughs> we'll call you in a week. And you stay tired here. The reality of it, because water damage does not have laws, we didn't any inherit any risk, but we still provide them a disclaimer saying, hey, we instruct you to otherwise. If this ever comes up in court, we want to try to protect ourselves. Uh, but hotels are terrible. They're huge offenders. Um, all the bathrooms. I, I am very weird about my Every hotels. single bathroom and every single hotel, the wallpaper is just nothing but a just petri dish behind that wallpaper. Yep. Don't forget about all the splatter on the surface of it. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that. Sleep tight next time you want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> the bathroom that you're sitting right next to. Does it matter if it's Motel 6 or the Phoenician? Mm -hmm. No, actually, I've been in some high-end ones that very, very expensive stay in, and they're they're about the same. It's all about turning numbers, and the problem is, is they incentivize the general manager's um, bonus based on certain criteria. So they start cutting little corners here and there to try to get that done. I took, um, I took a black light to a hotel. Uh, oh, you're a brave man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you sleep that night? <laughs> I did. My wife doesn't know. <laughs> Um, green board. Green board, board is just chemically infused paper on a drywall to help reduce the possibility of mold. It is not mold um, proof. It is mold resistant. If it gets wet enough times, the chemical comes off and it will grow mold on it. So understand that green board is not the big safety. I prefer, especially when we do work in uh, mop sinks, anything like that, is to go with dense glass. The fiberglass reinforced drywall removing even more paper from it, reducing the chances of it being able to grow. It's not that much more. We typically put it in behind the FRP. So how to properly respond to those hazards? Obviously we know that's a really bad day at the office. Intrusions can happen anywhere. We've done big ones, small ones. Uh, did anybody know that Goodwill has a Black Friday sale? <laughs> We were surprised too. I was That's like, funny. I was like, is it, is it always Black Friday here? Like, is it normal attention? This is a Goodwill store. This happened Thanksgiving uh, night a couple years ago. Right after dinner, 10 o'clock came in and they said, we need to be open at 5 a.m. For what? Black Friday sale. <laughs> okay. Um, it can be done. We made it work, but uh, this is kind of uh, intrusions can happen anytime. Most of them always happen when we don't have a plan in place, right? It's never when you're doing a building shutdown and you got four guys on standby that are right there. It's usually when the plumber's like, oh, this is a simple task. I'm going to be there for an hour. And then bam, it's, something happens. So it can happen anytime, anywhere. Uh, done some big buildings, all kinds of different ones. Mud, this was a city problem. Water main blue, pumped all the mud and everything into this parking garage and had to be removed quite a bit of water in there. Commercial buildings are not exempt from that, especially right now with a shortage of labor. There's a lot of guys trying to work really fast and they're being forced to do things they haven't done before. So the reason I bring this up is I'm sure you guys are gonna be going to different remodels in your buildings. Keep an eye on that. Um, it's been a real big problem. We joined a group called Build Your Future Arizona to try to promote more people to go to trade school and not just go to college to get a degree that they don't use. Uh, we need people in our industry really, really bad. And a lot of you guys who've been doing for a long time, who have all this knowledge and expertise, are retiring. So who's going to be teaching them? We all know textbooks only go so far. So we're going to talk about science of drying. 
Um, ISCRC is the governing body for our accreditations and certifications. Three categories of water. You notice I still put the names in there, but we got away from calling it clean water, gray water, black water because customers think that black water, which is category three, must be black to be considered category three water. It doesn't have to be. We've tested water that looks dirty, that was safe, and we've tested water that looks perfectly clear, that is not. So we often refer to categories, not the colors. Uh, category three water is sewage backup. Category two water is your washing machine overflowing. Yeah, it's got soaps, yeah, it's got dirt. If you drink it, it's got great problem. Category one water is when it comes out of the fixture. Uh, next trick question. Can there ever be a category one flood in a building? Oh, yes. Okay. How? See? Okay. Less than one line, you see? Perfect. 21. So I'll take the two of you. What, what, let's say it's 50 square feet, right? It came out of the bathroom. What kind of things did it come in contact with while it was flowing? Coming out of the bathroom? We just don't oh, know. Once it touches something else, it's no longer category one. Correct. There's no three. such thing as category one. The source may be category one. Every flood is usually category two. So think about the think about the way that it travels. Uh, water falling out of the sky, category one. It hits the parking lot, comes into your building, it's category three. What am I giving you here? There you go. He's going to come out with all kinds of stuff. He's actually participating. <laughs> Did you have a question? Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. So water comes in through the parking lot, under the door. That's category three. Yeah, I completely understand how difficult it's going to be for both of us to go to the property manager and let them know that that carpet's going to be removed. But that's what the standards say. However, remember what I said? There's no laws when it comes to water. It's all about managing risk. If the property manager wants to make a decision say, I want to steam clean that. They can't. There's no law that says they cannot. Is there liability? Yes. Am I going to have a form for them to sign? Yes. But they can do it. Same thing with sewage. If sewage comes out, we've had clients say, it's one square foot of this carpet in this big area. I just, I just want to dry it and I want to clean it up. They can. They shouldn't, but they can't. It's their risk. It's their liability. Technically, can't rainwater trap into a building be free? Say it again. If you trap rainwater into a building, can't that be trap free? You know what? I absolutely love that question. If you hear it, does get them all. Absolutely. And that is exactly my concern with this regulation. Is when you're walking from your car, you're picking up pesticides, fuel, um, fertilizer, spit, pigeon cats, anything and everything, and you track it in, it should be category three. Nobody's going to go for that. So it's managing risk and liability. You but you, copy that? Oh, oh. <laughs> you got a cheater in there. But yes, <laughs> technically, it's yeah. what it brings with it when it comes into the building. But it's unrealistic. We can't live in a perfect world. We can't be in a bubble, right? So we've got to understand that what you guys do for a living, you are encountering certain risks. You're just trying to protect yourself as much as you possibly can. Please, please do not do this. We see engineers do this all the time. They go into where the flood is to go repair it. They forgot a tool, they go back to their office and they come back there to fix it all the time. Unfortunately, we're gonna be the bad guys and we're gonna photograph them with the infrared camera and say, yeah, the flood was there, but we're cleaning all the way there. So please, 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 please don't be that guy. Um, booties are really cheap. Uh, fashion comes around, if you give her information, she'll bring you some new boots. They'll slide over whatever boots you got on that are thick and textured, allow you to go in there and take care of it and just rip them off when you're done. Are those the other ones you gave her? Those are usable? They are. Yep, absolutely. How am I, I know we have a slide a certain time. How much? Uh, you're, you're fine. If we go a little bit over, it's okay. But at, at six o'clock, if these guys need to start leaving, they can. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll start brushing through some of this. Stop me if you want more. I want to be you know, respectful of you guys' this time, but I think as far as water, everybody's a little bit comfortable, right? Kind of situation. So let's get into a little bit more fun. So thermal imaging cameras, you guys have seen us use it. Please understand a thermal imaging camera is not a moisture detection tool. Thermal imaging cameras looks for temperature differential. 
which often when something is wet, it is evaporating. And because it's evaporating, it's changing the surface temperature. So yes, the camera can find wet areas. No, it is not a moisture detection tool. This is an example of a project. Uh, this is the janitor's closet. The call came in, said the janitor let the mop sink on for a little bit. We have a little bit of water right outside the door in that closet. When we came out and we used the infrared camera, we were able to see that the saturation was up. It wasn't even, it had these weird streaks to it. Often when water runs down the track and gets absorbed by wherever the drywall screws are. So as we looked further, we realized it came from up above. So yes, in this case, the camera worked, but I verified it with a moisture meter tool. Because again, this is just showing me it's cold. See, 75 degrees. Doesn't mean it's wet. When we set up our drying equipment, we documented now we've seen this 87 degrees. It's only, what, a 12, 13 degree change where you see how the camera changes colors. We do this with documentation. Because when I do a moisture meter tool, if I'm in a bad day or I'm running somewhere, and I just do one of these real quick and go, yep, that wall's dry. There's no proof of that. What if I skipped an area? Moisture pockets happen all the time. Sometimes we'd be drying and the bottom of the wall is dry, but four inches up, it's still wet because of the way the water traveled. So moisture meter tools are required to actually document moisture content. So this is my next one. Uh, tell me if you can guess what's wet in this bathroom. So here's the three things about it. This is a residential project. We came out, it has wallpaper. As you see, it was pulling away. We had a little bit of, uh, a little bit of mold growth there. We use an infrared camera, shows moisture. We use a non-penetrating meter, which is one that does not leave any marks on the wall. It pegs it wet. We then use the penetrating, put the prongs in it, and it pegs it wet. What's wet in this picture? Okay. You can't be winning all of <laughs> um, Okay, so if you say nothing, what? It's temperature, it's cold. But I told you, I use moisture meters. You gotta leave it right there. Air conditioner. Yeah, yeah, air conditioner. You gotta leave it right there. You gotta leave it right there. Come on, there's something else. <laughs> Come on, you've been doing this long enough. Think about old school wallpaper. Oh, I was figuring that it was. Uh, an old uh, evaporative cooling house that they converted to a air conditioner and you have condensation inside the duct that's dripping down the back of the wallpaper. Nothing was wet. Some aluminum back wallpaper. <laughs> it's an old, old structure. The reason I bring this example up is all the best tools in the world mean nothing if we don't know what we're doing. You know, if I give somebody in for a camera and motion meter and say, go, and if it Dings, you cut it out or you dry it. And how did you get an elevated moisture reading? Because the non-penetrating meter is reading that metal and it's saying that's wet because moisture and metal will do the same thing, right? So it's, the aluminum backing was given the moisture meter a false read. And the pins went in and it created electricity between itself and said, hey, I'm it's transmitting really quick and, and easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It feels convection. Correct. Yeah. So understand that cameras, meters mean nothing if you don't know how to use them. You guys know this in your industry as well. If I get you the best drill, doesn't mean you know how to go build something. <laughs> so I understand when you're working with contractors, just because I have the best equipment does not mean to have the best training. Yeah, it was very, very old. You learned the hard way. So going on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest. <laughs> We ribbed this further and then put it in the wall and it was no longer registering. Wow. Put it back down, put it in the wall, it was registering. That's how we found out. And how are they ever going to find a new match for that wall? <laughs> Pretty sure they weren't emotionally attached to it at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for that. <laughs> okay, so as far as mold remediation as best as I'll kind of run through this quick. Number one thing is engineering controls. Containments must be pretty. Why? Because if you're putting so much effort in making sure it's hung right, it's done right, then this is the type of work you're going to do. If you went to a carpenter who had rough edges, didn't really care about it, glued this, all that, that shows how work is going to do. So we believe in containments. Not only are they necessary to do what we do, but they also give people that warm and fuzzy that things are being done right, especially tenants. If they're walking by and it's hanging up here, it's three different colors of tapes, 
what are they going to start thinking? Well, who do they hire? Some handyman guy doing this? And even if he's doing everything correct, perception is reality. So please be aware of that. Um, when doing containments, another thing to consider is air balance. Depends on where the containment is. If the intake's on this side, supply on this side, I'm going to have negative positive pressure. And also fire. If you're blocking out the sprinkler head, fire marshals do not like that. So it has to be thought of, of how it's being done. Uh, dust barriers, they come in all kinds of different ways. Obviously, you've seen them in plastics. They do have hard barriers, usually for longer term projects. If it's going to be like six months, they'll actually frame it in drywall. But the reason for that, it's not because it's a better isolator. It's so nobody can uh, cut it, puncture it, and there's no maintenance required with it. Um, they come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. This one needed to have a scissor lift run through it. So obviously it was made with dual zip zippers and made it bigger, uh, long walls. Another one, this was at a department store that was doing some renovations and demos. Uh, we built them high. That is Mr. Omar over there. This was at a facility that processed food for the airlines and their swamp coolers were falling in. And oh, it was either shut down or they had to perform work that uh, was approved. So as you can imagine, this was a really, really big containment. Um, super fun. Really, really fun to do this. I, I, the, the big ones are challenging, but they're really fun. I'm sure they said it too. No, no, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> but containments have one purpose, is to protect the uh, occupied space from the work area to make sure it does not become cross-contaminated. Latest news. Um, there's been a couple companies out there that have created these panels. They're reusable modular systems. So if you have a project that's coming up that you want to control access to, these doors are lockable. If you have a bunch of contractors going through, you see the striker plates on it. This is a register vent that puts an air scrubber on the backside of it to diffuse the noise to still be able to run the machine. As you see, these are very easy to go up. Uh, two minutes per linear foot, roughly is what it takes to build it. No damage, no screws, no bolts, no nothing. This is all held in by tape and pressure with no secondary damage afterwards, can go up. If you needed to bring something big in, you can take a few panels down, bring it in, put it back up. So if you encounter a situation that you need something more than plastic, just know that the industry has other options. They are also approved to be used in a hospital. This is at a VA hospital. It does meet, meet the ICRA criteria. Where's the stop? Uh, we have, I think, about 550, 600 linear feet, roughly, of a wall. Um, and if needed, it could do more. But with that, it, it handles quite a bit. Yeah, so there's your positive and negative pressure. It's very simple. Um, how do you know if it's positive? If you cut a hole and the air comes out, it's positive pressurized. If you cut a hole and sucks in, it's negative. Our industry requires negative. So that way, if somebody cuts it, something fails, it sucks the air in rather than burping the contaminants out. Uh, when dealing with a structure, we also got to understand the mechanical systems of it. It's not just about the bubble. You got to understand, I can draw air through there, or air can be delivered through there and create positive, but positive will happen at certain hours. So whenever doing this and designing, so working with the contractor, make sure you ask them those questions. Have you thought about the air changes? Have you thought about temperatures? Have you thought about fire and how do we escape and get out of it? For those of you that need them, they do have mobile carts. Um, I don't know if you guys run into that, but if you ever get a situation where you have to perform some work above a ceiling or through a ceiling tile, they have these carts, the air filter, everything's in there. You just roll up what needs to be, expand it up to the ceiling, do the work you need to do and it comes back down. It is OSHA approved and it is ICRA approved as well. I believe Sunbelt or United rents those. So if you have them, if you need them. Air scrubbers or fancy fans, um, they come in every size. They're all the same thing. As long as they have a HEPA filter in them, they all do the same thing. There's only one variable that goes with it. How often the company changes their filters and how often they're testing their seals to make sure that equipment is well. This gets abused. And you, if you guys have seen these other projects, they're painted over, they're beat up, they're dinged up. Um, even our technicians, it's, it's not their stuff. I mean, we know when we work with somebody and it's not there. So understand if it looks like crap, it looks beat up, it's probably questionable a little bit. Emergency planning. So four questions that we ask people when we come in and talk to them and teach them about emergency planning. Do you have a disaster plan in place? Who's responsible for it? 
responsible for it, usually I get this. Nobody knows. Or they'll say John is, and John's like, what plan? So if you play a role on making sure the building is operating, make sure you guys know what is going on. And the reason we ask these two is what have you learned? What have we learned is kind of like the download after the battle. What did what went well, what did not? Maybe when they parked in front of the building and the trucks that got mold on it created a lot of problems that lasted for two months. Lesson learned, they parked in a loading dock. Maybe it's the way they entered. Maybe it's not having the names ahead of the time that slowed it down. What are those lessons that you have learned that can be applied as you plan forward? And then what is the most important part in the building? Maybe there is a uh, server on the fourth floor that's communicated with by five different states from this small tenant, the guy who occupies 3,000 square feet, but most of it's serving, you didn't know that. So as you do these plannings, think beyond just the building. Think about the occupants and how they're using those buildings and making sure you have a plan in place of how to keep them operational when that time comes. Uh, working together with all of your vendors, creating it. I'm a big supporter of electronic. Makes it easier. Um, Paper is sitting in a folder somewhere in somebody's office. And guess what? If something changes, who's updating it? And when was the last time it was updated? Digital is easier. And plus, Dropbox and everything else is so cheap and so easy to come by to now that it, it shouldn't be any reason why it's still in paper. Uh, data mining. This is what we tell people to do in their buildings, is identify all their different water valves, where they are. Get a map, put a little star, something on it. But if you are not there and you're on vacation, you don't want to get that call at two o'clock in the morning because somebody doesn't know where it is. Plan ahead of time. Electrical, where is that located? We talked about the staging. Any specialty equipment. Having interest uh, paperwork on file is beneficial, not because you are an expert and you're going to read it, but if the adjuster comes out and he has a question about the policy, well, I don't know. It's going to take me a few days before I can get back to you. Well, sir, here's the policy. Can you look at this right now? This will keep the project going. Adjusters are overworked and underpaid. So they're going to try to turn and burn. And trying to get a hold of them on the phone afterwards, ooh, difficult. Building plans, please, 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 please have some building plans. It is so hard for us as a contractor. When you give me rolled up plans that are disintegrating and they're um, black in color, they have not been updated in a while. So if there's anything we can do to help, please let us know. There's a lot of companies out there right now that will come out and map it out and give you updated plans a lot cheaper than you think. Heating and cooling, uh, big, big issue. We're in Arizona. So I love this because you guys will understand this. Uh, building engineer calls emergency August 22nd and says, hey, our transformer blew for our tower. I have no power and the building is climbing one degree every seven minutes. And he goes, we need electricity right away. I said, cool, what do you need? He does a calculation. It was 1.2 megawatts. For, for what? He goes, I thought about it. I did this. Just, I need it now, now, now. And I was like, okay. okay. And I'm trying to like slow him down. But like, that is a <laughs> lot of power. Are you sure? He said, yes, roll. Okay. Calls me five minutes later and says, stop. I did the wrong math. I need 400 kW. <laughs> so that's a, that's a big difference. That mistake almost cost him about seven grand. Damn. Because the way semi-trailers work and tractors, once they connect it, there's a fee. The tractor did not hook up yet. So he was safe and didn't get that fee. But if they connected, he was paying that dispatch fee. So plan ahead and find out what is your building need if it was to go down? Where will the generator go if it comes? If you think you're gonna run cables somewhere, okay. Talk about it in your budgets. Hey, maybe we should connect some pigtails right here. So if we ever go down, at least some of the critical systems stay operational. All of this planning ahead is what we try to bring to their attention. But don't dismiss this. Your janitorial companies can help with extraction. They're often there. Find out who it is. If you're not there in the middle of the night and they come across something, they can assist. Find out what all the vendors that you have in those buildings can help you with. Maybe you have a small electrical guy that can come out within 45 minutes, but he can't handle a big project. <laughs> I'll have two of them. Make it work. I know as us, we get contracts from, especially CBRE is very common for that. They'll get three vendors in the same category. That's fine. We don't get offended by that. Cause when you need us, and if we can't handle, there's somebody there. So take care of the building. Most common calls that we get are usually heating and power, especially after monsoon storms. Um, this was another project that they needed some power on, but problem spot coolers. Property managers think that we just plop up and they cool the room. Where's the heat go? 
<laughs> so understand some of those things and understand what it's going to take to stay cool in those areas. Um, ask yourself this question. Are you proactive or reactive? Obviously, we know reactive when it comes to restoration companies will say, oh, we'll just call, uh, call them when we need them. We hate to see them come. It's always expensive. I don't want to talk to any of them. Proactive one, have a conversation with them. Find out what they're capable of. Can they handle these projects? Small ones, big ones. A lot of restoration companies don't do repairs. They'll do the mitigation and they'll leave. We get those calls when they're like, they just left. <laughs> Who's going to put it all back? Okay, well, that should have been asked in the beginning. What can they do? So please, please be uh, proactive, not reactive. Question you can ask yourself of what I can do that's quick and easy. Who do I call for different situations? What are the capabilities and how fast can they arrive? Going back to it, we have janitorial companies that we work with. If they're in the building, we just call them and say, hey, I know your service is building. Can you start extraction while we're mobilizing? Sure, we're gonna be there 45 minutes, but that's 45 minutes of water sitting there or spreading further when they can help contain that. You'd be surprised every 30 minutes can eat up a couple thousand dollars really, really quick. Do no harm. So this is the part I want to talk about the changes. So we know that COVID has created all of this new attention and all of these companies have come out with this miracle product. How many of you have seen one that says that uh, you can spray this product on the surface and it'll protect for 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days? Right. Look at the fine print. It's never against COVID, it's always against bacteria. None of the <laughs> so if you get into it, in fact, if you look at this same product, second page, we are pretty convinced about this performance as an antiviral too. Pretty convinced? What's, what's pretty convinced? So read the fine print. EPA has not approved any products that are antiviral for longer than when you first sprayed it on for any kind of residual. EPA has not approved that. So they're putting it out there. They'll use terms like independently tested. Okay, you're the lab. Here's my product. Here's a thousand dollars to test it. Conflict of interest. So read the fine print. This has been happening a lot, especially last year. I mean, everybody was popping out with this new, uh, new, I call it snake oil, right? It's kind of going back to the old ways. Um, Nano coatings, all these different things that they've come out as well, are developing the safe antiviral when they already say new anti COVID service developed, developing. That's how they fight the, the lawsuits. Well, we're, we're, we're saying we're developing, but it says that there, eh, it's close enough. Read the fine print. Um, those new shiny objects are usually not good to go after. Handles and self cleaning elevator buttons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How about these ones? You remember all these little light bulbs, all these little devices that came out and made it look very cute and fun and made them feel good about it. Um, yeah, it, it does not work in this application. But as you continue, this is just, I did a bunch of different examples. Look closely here should not be used on people, plants, or animals. This device is not designed to treat, cure, or prevent any diseases. But they're selling it to you. You see the brand here. What's the same brands over there? They all have the same light. However, there are products that do work. And I wanted to show you this. If you ever been in a hospital, they're very big on infection control. You guys ever seen their disinfecting robot? He's on sale right now for 14.4. However, here's a problem with it. The robot goes in, it blasts the light all over. It uses UVC. UVC is a light that will kill bacteria, germs, and everything. The problem that sucks with it, it'll create skin cell cancer because it's harmful. But there's three nanometer waves to it. There's a 405, 450, and 470. 450 is the one that creates harm to us. The other ones are still safe. And it's been difficult to separate it. So in the hospitals, whenever they have it, there'll be a sign that says disinfection or process. And if you look under the door, you'll see the light flashing. And the robot's job is to expose all the surfaces to this light to kill the bacteria. Look at the price tags. This is a small portable one. Look at the wattage that it takes. It's quite a bit. However, 
New stuff has been coming out. This is an example of that robot there. This is an example of operating rooms. This is, again, tells you about the nanometer wavelength of it. The products that may work are coming out. And they're coming out in this type of form, EPA tested, FDA tested. This is a normal light fixture that you will see in a commercial building. What they did is they provided the four to 5,000 on the common scale as far as the color of the light, but it has UVC built into it, removing the 450 wavelength so it doesn't harm. So if you have property managers, you have buildings that are wanting to increase safety, but does not mean make it 100% safe. It cannot be sterile. As soon as we come in, it gets dirty, but it helps keep it clean. We're seeing that being put in the elevators. We're seeing it being put into critical areas like where a lot of people gather, lobbies, um, conference rooms. There are things out there that work, but it's still new technology. Right now it's been tested and been proven to work. Uh, this kind of gives you a list from the EPA of everything that they said it will kill. UVC light will kill SARS-CoV-2 in 23 seconds. So it does work. It's just, I don't know if I believe that that wavelength has been removed. And you have to hold it there for 22 seconds. Um, it would actually be a light fixture the whole time. So cam lights and everything, it would be working the entire time. Nobody would ever notice different light bulbs. I did reach out to them. The T8 light bulb runs what about 800 bucks right now? Somewhere around there, uh, they're 24. But it's got 30,000 hours, so it's LED. So there are things out there that work, but if somebody says it's magic juice that we spray on and you're safe for 60, 90 days, it should be red flag. Okay, I do wanna answer that question about the heat. I forgot that in this one, I skipped that because we talked about the agenda. Uh, when it comes to heating the buildings, yes, it is still utilized today, but you gotta understand the challenges that come with it. You have to control the temperature, so you don't wanna be over, there's actually a trademark on drying buildings over 105 degrees that was done by a guy who sued the company called Water Out. So you cannot dry a building over 105 degrees, otherwise you can get sued. Let's say we're at 103. What does that do with your occupancy? If the building is vacant, you can dry at 95 degrees, 100 degrees without even needing to use major heating elements. Turn the heat up in the building. My equipment, because it's all electric motors, gives off heat as a byproduct. My dehumidifiers are actually your AC systems running backwards. They're in a heat pump mode all the time. So the exhaust that's coming out is dry but warm. So my equipment itself will help raise the temperature if I'm able to shut down the AC or set it for 85, 88, those kind of temperatures. Using the systems that actually have heating coils, what we know about electricity and heat, it needs quite a bit of it. So now you start running into issues of what systems are gonna be able to run on outlets. And because of all these renovations and the GC is doing a perfect job, they're sometimes tying circuits together the way they shouldn't, not the way to find out when you have breakers popping all the time. So yes, it's still utilized, utilized in our industry, not as much, mostly in residential because you're dealing with wood framing. So you really want the heat to penetrate through the drywall and other materials to create evaporation and remove it. As I was mentioning earlier in commercial buildings, what are we drying? Gypsum and a cloth on the floor. So using heat is not necessary, but my record are the fastest drying wood structure condo was 14 hours. We cooked at about 103 degrees. But what the property manager said is, this is the first unit that's being sold. It's Friday at 10 p.m. This person is moving in Monday at 8 a.m. I said to them, do you have a blank check? And they said, yes. And we got it done, 14 hours to dry it. As soon as we were dry, we came in, we were stretched the carpet, we started putting base on, we touched up paint, all of that. Sunday, they had a janitorial crew come in, clean it. I never knew when he moved down on Monday. It can be done, but it will cost more. It's kind of like with document restoration, right? When we have all these papers, people always want to restore them. I'm going to tell you right now, if you have documents that have gotten wet in boxes, that restoration project starts at 10K because you got to get a freeze dry truck there that's coming in at negative 20, negative 30. I got to put these boxes in there and I got to freeze the water right away to keep it from running and going further. Well, how do I remove those crystals and that ice from that document? Well, I have to go from a solid state straight to a gas state and skipping the liquid state. So in order to do that, you have to use desiccant dehumidifiers. That means you have to build a chamber that cost just keeps racking up. So every time we get a call and somebody says, I need these documents restored, first question I ask is, can you reprint them? Because 10K is where it starts at. So same thing with heat drying. Sure, I can put all these things in there. 
But is it necessary? No. Am I still using the methodology and the science behind that? Absolutely. And what are them going off? Yeah, I forget what the temperature is. But I think 150. Yeah, most we see 145 to 155. You know, then you've got some lower ones, and I know they can also go by different colors. It depends on where this being used. So there's a lot of those different things to consider, but you can't exceed that 105. So now you got to think about what happens when I do exceed. I need to vent. So now you have to be in the building or have a system set up that vents it. Well, what does that do? It compromises the security of the suite or the building. I just want to clarify. You're saying that there's a dude that has a patent yeah. on letting a building get over 105 degrees yes. for the purpose of for drying. Up. Correct. What about the purpose of getting rid of the bed bugs? Does not apply. He was a restoration guy. So another organization that we're in is RIA. And RIA is part of the members. We actually have a fund for an attorney that if we are ever found ourselves, because if I set it up for 103 and it exceeds 105, he technically can follow the lawsuit, but I'll have to prove that that wasn't my goal. He just ran away from me. But if I intentionally set those temperatures, yeah, hardly have to pattern their noise, the way their body sound. <laughs> he sued the company, called, the company was called Water Out. Water Out used radiators and glycol. They would have the trailer with a propane burner and they would pump the glycol into the building, into the radiator, fan would go across it and go back and the loop went over and over. That company is no longer around because it got sued for that. Why can't that heat really to blow up? Who said that? Oh, for purposes of drying. Because this dude's company has a patent on it. It's his gimmick and he can to, to dry the building. The patent office to yep. let him file. <laughs> yeah, for the purposes of drying, bed bugs, whole different thing. It's not his industry. He can't have a blanket on everything. Mm -hmm. It's for drying specifically. We had a couple more questions. Of course. Uh, in Arizona, I mean, I'm like, that my air conditioner might just happen to break down <laughs> yeah. at the exact time I need to get the water out. And that's why we have the lawyer fund for just in case those <laughs> lawsuits pop up. To defend them. No, it's a pure coincidence. The air conditioner broke down 10 minutes after we had that massive flood. I <laughs> pure coincidence. I've we've been in a building that they had no AC, it was all glass, they had a flood, and we went in there and it was 130 degrees inside. No, actually, you were you were 142, and it was he sent me the meter, <laughs> and I was like, "So do you have cold water with you, or what are we doing that?" And we left it like that. They had no uh, no power, so we we just ran a little bit that we could for our blowers. We were over 140 the whole time, but we didn't set out to do that. That was a byproduct of the building not having. Uh, both of these go back to asbestos. Uh, the first one was, what if we have an emergency and we have to cut a hole and don't have time to have the material tested? Is that findable? Absolutely. So the question I would ask is, what emergency can exist where we don't have three hours to get the results back? And if it does, then you just treat it as asbestos. You can use a glove bag. Uh, for those of you that, anybody know what a glove bag is? Okay, a trash bag that literally has glove, uh, like sleeves that go into it. They make them to go around pipes. They can also make them to go on the wall. So if you take that glove bag and you tape it all the way around, it pops out, but now you have gloves and you have hands. So you can actually cut the holes and everything you need. You set up your vacuum so it becomes this negative pressure and you're controlling it. So there's a lot of different ways to overcome that if it needs to be done. Don't but forget to put your keyholes on the bag before you get it. <laughs> <laughs> You've done that? <laughs> um, so yes, it can be done, but I always ask what kind of emergency can exist where three hours is, is not enough time, right? But obviously, if there is a pipe back there that's leaking, somebody will say, Well, I gotta cut it open to get to it. My answer is gonna be like, go to the valve, shut that off, shut that section off. Shut the building off if you need to, because an asbestos violation um, is painful. It is public. It's going to piss off all the property manager company. It's going to piss off the building owner, which most likely the property manager is going to lose that company. So the question I would ask, is it worth the risk and the cost? Second one was, with asbestos materials being exhausted to the exterior during abatement, what is a safe distance from the exhaust returns to pass by? Do the filters catch everything? 
99.97% efficiency is a HEPA filter uh, down to 0.03 micron. Most asbestos fibers that we encounter are about 0.1 micron. At 0.03, you are capturing it, but again, 99.97. So the chance of you inhaling is 0.03. It's pretty low. Um, EPA has approved that method. It is a lot to do with appearances more than safety. A tenant will smell, or even somebody walking by, they will smell the, um, the products that we're using in there, right? So amended water. Amended water is just basically soapy water. It's, it's wetter water. Uh, it helps keep those fibers down. It has a scent to it. When we're using encapsulant, it has a scent to it. All the guys that are sweating in there, in that human environment, have a scent to it. <laughs> so if you ever seen guys in a baby project for long ones, they're actually in their boxers, and then they have the suits on. Because when they come out, they have to shower. So you got a bunch of guys in there who are eating from a roach coach who may have been drinking that before. You got all these fragrances. Somebody who smells it can panic and think that it's something harmful, even though it's just a scent. So ideally, we want them pointing up as much as possible to get away from that and to give people a little warm and fuzzy. Hypothetical, you got a brand new building, year old engineer that was there from the day they broke ground. We've got all the closeout docks, we've got all the material docks, we have the material manifest, we know everything's put into that building, we know it all, that is not a single stitch of it exceeds the asbestos rate. Do I spell out the sample? How do you know all that? I've got all the material manifests. I've got everything. Everything was sampled. Oh, so in. everything was sampled? Yep. If it was sampled, then no, you don't. That's the key thing. How who's going to sample every material that comes in? Who's going to have that? Five letters. Yes. So, so, you're, so what you're saying, just because it's a new building and you have a big old stack of documents there that says everything's okay and everything is what's supposed to be there, you don't get to get away with not sampling? <laughs> that will be a lean you are you're referring to hypothetical <laughs> that correct that will nobody will ever spend that type of money on it one two here's a here's a the thing that maricopa county did those numbers or those samples and results are only good for 12 months all right so everybody that thinks you have you know everything about your building it's not possible that you Touching or disturbing asbestos, it's just not possible. Sample every time. Correct. It's a cheap cost. Uh, most tests, when we come out to a flood, they're what, between $495 to $795. It's, can it's, we order glove bags from Amazon? You can, but you're going to pay a lot more. I would tell you, go up to like a Betix or a Ramsco or call me, I can get you some. <clears throat> Here's a problem with glove bags. How big do you need? A four by four, a six by six, a 12 by 12, because they come in all kinds of sizes. Those guys are squaring out of. A fist wall, fist mark oh. in the wall. Then I would do a six by six just to give you enough space. Because remember, you got a gloves, you got tools, you need some of those things in there. What you, you don't want is the random tenant that took a class just like you're taking right now and sees you using that keyhole saw to square off that punch hole behind the wall, so you can pick your patch and goes, ah, I cut you. Or even worse, I'll say, oh, this is an old building, it's gotta have asbestos. Um, we had a flood that we were doing for um, Cushman, and he goes, you know. <coughs> We were just extracting water. Like you were on it, weren't you? Um, and I get a call saying ADEQ is here as our Department of Environmental Quality. I'm like, for what? They said they've got to call a complaint that you guys are doing asbestos abatement without containment and all of that. <laughs> when the inspector comes out, we're like, we're sucking up water. What are you talking about? He said, okay, well, are you doing any demolition? We're like, no, that ceiling tile collapsed. It was, uh, was it an expansion tank? I think it was right above water heater or something. It shot up, so it ate up the ceiling tile. It all came down. We left it right there, just left it alone. You can't clean it up. Maybe asbestos containing. He comes in and says, well, do you have asbestos survey? We said, no, we don't, because we just called the hygienist and he took sample. What did he take samples? Because the company we use puts a piece of tape and puts a number and everything on it and it document it. We were able to take him and say, look, this is where all he sampled. He said, great, you have no issues. I don't understand why I'm here but he still had to write it up. I don't have it in this presentation. I have a presentation from it. Um, they still had to document it, still had to inspect it. When, when somebody calls a violation like that, they will be out within two hours. They will come out really, really quick. And we still had to send a report out there just to confirm that they were Correct. Doing that. Um, the thing that sucks about enforcement is done by, um, I think we're District 9 headquarters for EPA for our district, San Francisco. 
So in EQ out here, they don't have a lot of money for enforcement, but they will run out to every violation and collect the funds that they need. Here's what I say. Um, I mean, I've already go back on this. I, if I come across a willful violation that's just negligent, I will turn them in. And here's why. Even if it's my competition or not. It's not because I'm trying to knock them out, but here's the thing. Let's say you don't know better and you're an employee for that company and you go to work and you create this disturbance and you got dust and dirt, everything on you. And you come home and you hug your six month old child and they put their head on your shoulder and they inhale it. And then age 10, they're dying from lung cancer. That's where I think it's my responsibility to do that. I'm not looking to beat them down or anything like that. I'm protecting the people who don't know, who can't protect themselves. That means sometimes the workers, they just weren't trained. Um, as we're hiring, we get guys that come out from restoration companies that are like, oh yeah, I'm as, I do as best as, are you certified? Nope. Have you had a fit test? What's a fit test? It, just recently, so I'm an umpire for insurance companies. So an umpire is basically when you got a contract, you got an insurance company. They say we're charging this much, insurance company says this. They hire appraisers, appraisers can't come to terms. Then they have to go to an umpire. Umpire looks at all of it. I had a case that came across my desk that was $24,000 the contractor was charging. Insurance company was giving them 5,100. I gave them 5,100, I said, I wish I can give you zero because they said, we did everything by the standards. They threw all these OSHA things out there. And as soon as they did, I said, awesome. You guys follow OSHA. I want to see everybody's respirator fit test. I want to see everybody's medical card. I want to see everybody's certification. I want to see your all of these documents. It took 22 days for them to try to get it to me. And even then it wasn't right. It was falsified. Yeah. I would have given them zero on that project. But if the insurance company is okay with that 51, and I wrote in there, and I even ended up saying, this is an embarrassment to our industry. And this is a big company that goes out, does a lot of work, sometimes in our arena. It's not sometimes employee. It's sometimes it's not the supervisor. They just don't know any better. It's usually guys up top who know better and are just not willing to put money into it. We were just talking the other day. It cost me about five grand to train a guy for the basic water training. If they go to asbestos, it's 40 hours. That, that class starts about 3K right now, plus his time, plus everything else. It's a lot of money. Absolutely, it's a lot of money. What they're doing for you guys here right now still takes money, right? So these companies, they're just, it's, our industry is really bad. It's really bad. Find a positive note to end on. <laughs> Silver was lining. the food good <laughs> <laughs> um, just you know the one th the one positive i'll say about this is um i trust this company i've worked at this company for a long time even before i was even close with dan or even you um oh god a long time you guys are always better than other engineers that we run into. Alvaro knows the same thing. We run into guys who say they're building engineers. They're not. They're glorified babysitters. They call us a couple subs. They don't know what's going on. Um, I, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be partnering with you guys. And I know that these guys take care of you. And even speaking with them, they're, they're always looking out for your well-being. So I, the silver lining would be in a, in a crappy world that we're in right now where everybody's out for themselves. We're still in, in a good environment. And so are you guys. So thank you for having me. Hopefully you guys learned something. It, uh, oh, one thing I didn't touch on was going to be real quick. The reason I put these in front of you is this is an app that we have. With this app, you can do two things. You can map out the building for all these critical systems that we talked about. But the best thing about it is it's called a provider. And what that means is as we go through different emergency planning and training, we have learned through FEMA and everybody else, that it is very difficult to make a phone call when you have bad service or when the towers are busy. What is easy to do is to send a text message. So this app is designed in a way that when you hit this call provider, you have a pop-up that says, who do you want to call them? If you hit cancel or no, it still sends me a text message with your info where you are and what's going on. It takes a couple seconds to dispatch us and you don't have to make the call. The example I use is an engineer that walked into his uh, electrical room and there was water pouring out. And he said, no freaking way am I using my phone in here? He used this, pushed it, tossed the phone, went back in, did what he needed to do. We were already rolling. This is monitored by 
where's the bar? I think like six or seven people in our office, all our project managers get it. We get it as a text, we get it as an email. And if you hit the call, it comes through. Um, so in the back, it tells you instructions of how to set it up. All you have to do is when you first set it up, put in your information in there, it saves it. You can always dispatch it and it'll always track it. So if somebody, property manager says, well, it took you too long to call. Nope, this is exactly when I call because I can send you that file. Also keep, you can put the uh, locations out of the valves on there. Yes, so, so that's automatically know where to go to shut something off. Correct. So the reason I didn't touch on that is because it's kind of a big topic. It's whenever yeah. you're preparing this, but yeah, but that's what the second button says view buildings. You won't have that come up unless you actually have buildings that are assigned to you. But absolutely, all your emergency preparing documents, shutoffs, electrical, all of that can be put in here. So when you're on the beach at two o'clock in the afternoon, the call comes in, you can just open it, screenshot it, send it to them, or even better, give other people access that they can get the information themselves. Okay? Great. But you, you, can, you can use this app to dispatch us 24-7. Hey guys, I know we ran a little late. Thank you for coming. If you didn't sign in, sign in up here. Please do sign in. We do keep track of that stuff. So, thanks again. Yes. yes.